Good afternoon. My name is Michael Wilds. I have the privilege of giving today's lecture, U.S. Immigration and Nationality Law, A Guide to International Student Client. It's my privilege uh, to be here today with uh, Longline. I appreciate your trust that you have in this fine institution and that they have in our practice. I'm a managing partner of a law firm called Wilds and Weinberg, started by my father. I'm a second generation immigration lawyer. He started it back in the day in 1958. We have offices in New York, New Jersey, a new satellite uh, office in Miami, and coming soon will be an affiliation in Los Angeles. All we practice is uh, U.S. immigration law, and I urge people to send me an email if you have questions. We're here as a resource. I have the privilege of being a former federal prosecutor, a mayor where I live in New Jersey, uh, as well as an adjunct professor of business immigration law at the Cardoza Law School. We're here today to talk about a very important uh, subject, and as we see the national debate and the international debate on refugees and immigration, there is a fallout on your student client, and it's important for lawyers who are in this field to get things right, and for those that are acclimating towards it to understand the journey. Well, what is U.S. immigration law? First of all, it's a system of laws passed by the United States Congress and implemented by federal agencies governing the movements of foreign nationals in and out of the United States. If you look at the chart on the PowerPoint, you'll see that there is actually a journey that foreign nationals take uh, into the United States. On the right side of the uh, Isle of Rights, if you would, would be U.S. citizens. And on the left side are visitors. And these are non-immigrant visa statuses. They're lettered from A to V. And it's your task as a lawyer to help people ascend in their legal rights. The B and the F. We're going to be talking about the F student uh, visas shortly, but the B visa and the F visas are the least amount of rights that individuals have on U.S. soil. In fact, they have to certify to American consuls the world over at embassies and so forth that they will be going home to an unrelinquished domicile in their home country. And they are the most tenuous uh, visas. American consuls like to delay them and deny them all the time. Uh, the truth is that the denial rate for people being readmitted to the United States and the same kind of challenges can occur if a person proves that they may have a dual intent. A student who is in America, a visitor who's going to Disney World or to a business meeting, who's traveling and can prove a different narrative, the government then can stop that person. And they should have always a proof of their strong ties to their home country if they want to shoulder the burdens that the law carries. The H-1B visa category, the professional worker, is the, the best position to be, or the L-1, the H-1B being a professional worker based on specialty occupations. If you have a job requiring a degree in the L-1 or intracompany transfer, here the Immigration Act, the statute itself, permits those individuals to have a dual intent to actually go forward on this scale of rights uh, and be here for extended periods of time. A lawyer's job in this case is to help clients acclimate from the F-1 during their OPT optional practical training time, and we'll get into that a little later, into one of these statuses, the H or the L, and then they can go forward and apply for LPR, which is lawful permanent residence, or a green card, um, and from there they can become citizens. Typically, people become citizens of the United States if they've been married to an American citizen and have a green card uh, based on marriage. It's three years or five years um, if it's the, through employment that you secured your citizenship. When clients come to our office, we're always working to see that we anticipate what a client would like in the future. They may just want to go to school now, but if they decide later after they're in school that they want to stay here for a period of time, ultimately that narrative may change and it's your job as a lawyer to not only advise your clients, but to make sure that you anticipate what they may not anticipate when they first meet you. F-1 student visas are accorded to foreign nationals and generally you get a one year OPT, an optional practical training for each ascending degree. So if you get a bachelor's degree, you get a one-year optional practical training. After a master's, another, and after a PhD, yet another. That optional practical training allows people to work, and it's during that time you have to be sensitive to apply for status. Immigration is a journey, 
that is either one that's intended to be here on a temporary basis or a permanent basis. We do not have a system of points like Australia and Canada. The government recognizes that there are only two ways to be here. You want to be here temporarily or permanently. Generally, there are three overarching ways of getting a status. It's either based on a relationship to somebody, based on employment, or based on investment. Of course, there are paths for nationals who have political asylum or otherwise to come into the system, but this is the overall uh, structure of our system. There is a presumption of immigrant intent. By law, all persons applying for visas or admission to the border are presumed to have intended of residing in America permanently as immigrants. This presumption must be overcome and a visa would be issued and then you're admitted. This presumption of immigrant intent that you're presumed guilty, if you would, of wanting to stay here permanently is something you need to overcome. The only exceptions are in the H-1B and the L visa where it's expressly stated in the status in the statutes and it permits a person to have a dual intent. The burden of proving your non-immigrant intent, whether it's a visitor's visa, a student visa, or otherwise, rests with the applicant. One way of doing so is through evidence of an unrelinquished foreign domicile. Children who live in their parents' home are not presumed to own real estate, but as people get older, showing salaries and ties and business holding and a, a voluminous amount of relatives abroad is a great way of proving this. The same presumption applies when an applicant is filing for extensions of a non-immigrant visa or visa reissuance abroad, the burden stays with the individual. Hence the adversarial sense of propriety that we see at borders. There are ways for you once you come into America to change your status. That, and then there is the adjustment of status. This is for lawyers to be familiar. It's more in the lingo of our space where a person goes from one non-immigrant temporary status to another non-immigrant temporary status, they're deemed to be changing their status. Whereas a person who is going from a temporary status to a permanent status is deemed to be adjusting their status. A foreign national enters and a non-immigrant may apply to adjust their status to permanent residence. Generally, these applications must be filed by employers, certain family members, or independently by each person. The rule of thumb is it's like a giant game of tag. You have to be in a status before you can change to another one. If you fall out of step even for one single day, by operation of law, the visa in your passport is no longer valid and you may then be done from being able to change or adjust in the future. There are provisions under Section 245K of the Act that allow a person to adjust even if you've stepped out of status for a six month period of time but you need to uh, c uh, consult with an attorney to review that. Let's talk about your client, the full-time student. A student is required to be a fully matriculated student in an academic program that is an institution approved by USCIS by immigration. They are allowed to stay here for the duration of status issued on the Form I-20 issued by the school, and they can apply for an F-1 visa endorsement at the U.S. Embassy they have to show that they have sufficient funds for tuition and living expenses during the period of intended stay and must maintain a residence abroad with no intention of ever giving it up. They are admitted for another term of our DS, duration of status at a port of entry, and they're given ultimately a 60-day grace period upon which the end of their student visa, they can then either change status or depart the United States as a gentleman or a gentle lady if they want to, um, at, and that happens at the end of their OPT when they have an employment document or at the end of their studies. Students fundamentally must maintain their student status. In order to do so, they have to be enrolled on a full-time basis at least with a minimum of 12 credits each semester unless specifically authorized by the Office of Student Affairs. You have to ensure that the passport and the I-20 are valid at all times and the Office of Student Affairs keeps you updated on enrollment and residential address. They must notify the Office of Student Affairs if they leave the United States before completing their program of study and obtain extensions of their permission to remain in America before their I-20 actually expires. Students are required to carry their passport and 994 card with them at all times. You are deemed to be violating your status if you fail to maintain full-time enrollment with a few exceptions. 
if you engage in any unauthorized employment, it's safe to say that the only way you'll ever get a green card if you engage in unauthorized employment would be on the family side of the ledger rather than on the employment side of the ledger. I take this up in my law school class often, and it is a problem. So you have to encourage your clients always to stay within the confines of what they anticipate. We've had clients challenge when they have online businesses. Even though it's in cyberspace, they're still working. Even if they're at a Starbucks, you have to be very careful. If a student fails to request authorization from withdrawing from classes or extending their program or doesn't transfer to a school without filing appropriate procedures, they will be deemed to have violated their student status. Also, if they fail to enroll by a date specific by the school or they don't file proper procedure for changing academic programs. Any failure to notify the school and the SEVIS system that the school designated student official, the DSO, in the schools are required uh, when it comes to change of address also hurts a student's status. The most important, however, is any criminal activity may jeopardize your right to stay in the United States. And that has great consequence and creates a, tr a treasure trove of crim immigration, the intersection of criminal and immigration law, and we have a robust practice in that space. With regard to traveling abroad, if a student plans in traveling outside of America during the studies, they must have a Form I-20 signed by the designated school official before you leave. The advisor travel signature is only valid for six months, and you have to have a current signature on the Form I-20 that the student has. You should visit the Office of Student Affairs with your passport, is what we tell students, to make sure that the valid F-1 visa stamp and the I-20 are up to date and at least two or three weeks before traveling. Also, you want to make sure that your passport's valid for at least six months. Beyond the day you plan to re-enter the United States, you cannot enter the United States with an F-1 visa using a passport that's less than six months from an expiration. This is your travel abroad checklist. Valid passport, valid U.S. visa stamp except for Canadians that are exempted, Valid immigration document, it's either the Form DS-2019, the I-20, or the I-797. Those are three numbered documents depending on who's watching this and who your client is. You need to have a valid travel signature on the Form I-20 or the DS-2019, which is a form for J-1 visas. In most cases, no older than 12 months. And note, even travel within the United States, you are required to carry your original evidence of your lawful F-1 student status with you at all times, including your passport, I-20, and I-94 card. A word on driver's license for your clients, your student, your foreign students, that is. As a general rule, the F-1 may apply for a driver's license or ID as long as they uh, are in lawful status and present necessary supporting documents required to verify legal presence in the United States. Before applying for a license or ID, the non-immigrant student or exchange visitor should become aware of the appropriate state requirements, contact the, the DSO at the school, or the responsible officer, the RO, who will provide guidance and assistance in familiarizing the non-immigrant with the exceptions, uh, with the expectations of the DMV, as well as explaining the general process for obtaining a driver's license. Sometimes you have to wait a minimum of 10 days after the initial entry as an F1 non-immigrant visas in order to apply for a state driver's license or a state ID. There is a requirement also that you uh, file an income tax uh, return. All international students are required to file U.S. taxes even if they do not work or receive some other type of U.S. income. International students who do not receive U.S. income are required to uh, file a U.S. IRS form 8843. Those who do receive U.S. income, including scholarships, will need to file a non-resident federal and state form. Under certain conditions, an international student can file as a U.S. tax resident for tax purposes only. Tax forms for those who earned U.S. income are filed between January 1 and April 15. For those who do not receive income during the year, the filing deadline uh, is June 15. Employment authorization options. First, there's CPT. If a student is coming in and would like to work in their space during the curriculum, during the season that they're actually studying, this CPT authorization is granted by a DSO in the school on the Form I-20. Uh, and you need not have a 
work authorization document. It may be attained after one full academic year of undergraduate study or any time during the graduate studies. It's limited only to 20 hours a week when the school is in session and 40 hours a, a week on school holiday breaks. If a student completes one full year of CPT, the student is ineligible for the one year OPT. Very important, therefore, that you keep your CPT less than the 12 months. 11 months is a good rule. Economic necessity also has an exception. If there's a change in circumstance, the school wants you to be able to pay your tuition, you should go see a DSO. With regard to OPT, that's the generic authority to work for foreign students after they complete their degree. It works for 12 months. The process is again initially initiated by the DSO. We recommend the OPT apply within 90 days of completing your courses. It's not tied to a particular employer but to a field of study. If you think about it, an actress who works in a coffee shop could actually sustain the narrative that they're studying people and socialization skills and it is extrapolated to be wide but it must be tied to a particular field of study not an employer it's a generic authority you must obtain an EAD that's the employment authorization document from USCIS prior to the commencement of your employment and again as I said earlier you can get it one year for each ascending degree that you have after a bachelor's degree for a full year, after a master's, and after a PhD, it comes into play when it comes into our trying to maintain the status of somebody so that they have multiple options. There are reporting requirements for students on OPT. The reporting requirements are that all students are required to report to the DSO within 10 days of any changes of name or residential address. In addition, a student is required to fill out the form AR-11 online where you also have the same requirement within 10 days filling out the name and address of the employer and any interruption of employment. A rule of thumb, you're not allowed to accrue an aggregate of more than 90 days of unemployment during OPT. You don't have to be paid but you must be using the OPT. If you don't use it, you lose it. There are new STEM regulations. The, this has to do with students studying STEM fields, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Students holding degrees in these areas may extend their OPT by an additional 17 months for a total of 29 months, effectively giving them three shots at that coveted H-1B work visa. Examples of some STEM fields are actuarial science, computer science, engineering, mathematics, um, and physical sciences and so forth. An F1 student in the STEM field must currently be participating in their 12-month period of OPT, must have completed a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree in a STEM field, and the student's employer must be registered with and participating in the USCIS's E-Verify Employment Eligibility Verification form. A word on Social Security cards and numbers. If you get a job while in the United States, you will need to obtain a Social Security card from a U.S. Social Security office. This card will contain your Social Security number. You need the Social Security number for tax and employment purposes. Your Social Security number will never change, so you only need to apply once. To get a Social Security number, you need to get a referral letter from your international student advisor. You take this along with the other evidence of your job offer, your passport, your I-20 or the DS-2019 and school ID to the local Social Security office near you, you should def generally receive your card within two to three weeks. On a matter of timing, I think it's important for us to kind of just kind of pull the lens back on the timing of making these applications. A student, and this is a hot topic, um, is allowed to be in America for the duration of status the work authorization will fall out during a time that you cannot control. It's only given for that generic period of time. Knowing, of course, that H-1B visas can only be applied for in April 1, and as the viewing of this uh, video, we have now capped out to 65,000 H-1B visas. That is, on October 1, the fiscal year of each year, you're permitted to apply for an H-1B uh, it, excuse me, you're permitted to use an H-1B visa. Uh, this has great timing effects. So, in a nutshell, a student who holds an OPT 
at the time an H-1B is filed prior to October 1 is entitled to an automatic extension of their status and work authorization through October if an H-1B petition is filed and accepted with a request for change of status from, from an F-1 to an H-1B. A student who held OPT which expired less than 60 days prior to the time the H-1B is filed is entitled to an automatic extension of status only not work authorization until October if an H-1B is filed and accepted with a request for change of status from an F-1 to an H-1. Finally, if an OPT expires more than 60 days prior to the filing or if the H-1B is filed after October 1, a student is not eligible for cap-gap relief. In general strokes, cap-gap refers to the period of time that your work authorization expires and until the time that the H-1B will activate, which is generally in October. The concept again is if you don't use it, you will lose it. And there is a, an entirety of an experience that we prompt our clients so that they don't waste time. When, they, when a client uh, goes forward and gets an EAD and they're working for an employer, the employer only has to pay them a, a uh, a wage that is commensurate with minimum wage. It does not have to be a prevailing wage. Hence, a lot of employers don't want to apply for H-1Bs. We counsel a lot of students, therefore, and employers, either to take this in mind when they are open and transparent uh, to their students and give the student a graceful way of finding another job so an H-1B can be sponsored, or at least get started early on the H-1B process so they can identify their talent. Let's talk about some of the relevant non-immigrant visa categories. I'll be discussing these visas as they are visas that often your clients, the foreign student, would like to pivot to. There'll be visitors visas. For Australians, is the E3. There's the H-1B specialty occupation that I spoke about the cap gap time. There are the I visas for foreign correspondence, the J visas for exchange visitors, the L visas for intercompany transferees, people who work abroad, the O visas, an alien of extraordinary ability. We have huge scholarship and traction with this. The R1, religious workers, and then word on TN visas for Canadians, and then E visas for treaty traders and investors. The B visas are either B1 or B2. Those are individuals who are here for business or for pleasure. A B1 visitor for business should be on a foreign payroll. They should be in, engaged in activity in America benefiting a foreign employer. They're here basically for business meetings, training, and joint development projects. Basically not productive employment to a U.S. interest. The B2 are visitors for pleasure. They're going to Disney World. They're going to concerts. They're going to weddings. A foreign consular officer may endorse a visa to allow a prospective student to enter the United States with the intention of finding a school for a study or for a company for training. The B-2 is a pleasure. Now you may love, like I do, what it is that you do for a living, um, but you have to be clear when you make representations if it's for business or for pleasure or otherwise. Don't confuse this with the visa waiver program. Under the visa waiver program, we have a list of nations that allow that we allow American nationals are um, commensurately or reciprocally allowed to visit their country up to 90 days. These are historically countries with low rates of non-immigrant visa refusals and are permitted to enter as visitors for business or pleasure without first obtaining visas. Individuals entering under the visa waiver program are permitted to remain for a maximum period of up to 90 days and are barred from extending their stay or changing status while in the United States. These visitors are also prohibited from attending school or engaging in employment. Effective January 12, 2009, it's now the ESTA, the Electronic System for Travel Authorization Program. Individuals go online, they get permission, they make an entry. The countries range from Andorra to the United Kingdom, and it is a political process where com companies or countries are always trying to get themselves listed, and they are, again, um, relationships that we have that are stronger than others. A word on the H-1B visa. 
The H-1B visa is a specialty occupational worker. This is the bread and butter of our practice as well as the visa that your foreign student will ascend to. The requirement basically is that the person have a bachelor's degree and truthfully a pulse. A professional with a U.S. bachelor's degree, the experiential equivalent of a bachelor's degree, the government allows you to take three years of experience to one year of school that you may have missed. Sometimes a person has an associate's degree, so you take six years experience and then you have the equivalency of a bachelor's degree. Or if a person has a master's degree or higher, PhD, MD, JD, etc. These individuals will be performing services and occupations requiring a theoretical and practical application of highly specialized knowledge. The petitioning U.S. employer must offer a prevailing wage. So here your student has to deal with this culture of being paid one wage where EAD cards allows a person to go immediately on a w payroll during their OPT period of time but then they have to raise an eyebrow and decide independently if they want the person to work and pay them the higher prevailing wage. The position must be directly related to the foreign nationals field of study. By extrapolation, the government will challenge you if you don't have something on, on the money, as it were. The H-1B visa status is, is allowed up to six years. One year incremental extensions may be granted if 365 days or more have passed since the filing of an application for a labor certification or an employment-based based preference petition. Moreover, if you have an application um, that's pending um, where the petition was already approved with immigration, not just the labor certification, a three-year extension uh, may be approved and the quota, if the quotas are backlogged. And finally, extensions are available on your H-1B beyond six years until permanent residence is granted um, if you follow the protocol. We generally start talking to our clients immediately after they get their H-1B about the process of navigating the waters for a green card through the Labor Department or family preference if one presents. Be careful that you don't encourage somebody into the wrong marriage for the right papers or the wrong employer for the right solution. The ethics of this are very clear. You represent both the employer and the individual and you have an obligation to make sure that you do cancel the H-1B visa um, with the uh, permission of your employer and so forth and the again the delicacy of dealing with the ethical propriety of transferring information and canceling visas needs to be discussed at great length. The H-1B has an annual cap of 65,000 visas. This year the cap was reached during the initial five-day filing period resulting effectively in a lottery. Only about a third of the cases filed were selected. You expect another lottery this coming year. There are 5,200 that are set aside for nationals of Chile or Singapore, 2,600 each. And there's an additional cap of 20,000 for individuals with a U.S. master's degree or higher. Employers that are exempt from the H-1B cap or institutions of higher education um, where they are either a bachelor's degree or higher or nonprofit organizations affiliated with the institutions of higher education and government research organizations. An H-1B visa can be secured for your client and is available for an additional $1,225 on a premium processing basis where you'll get an answer from them in 15 days. The H-1B has a portability clause that enables non-immigrants currently in H-1B status to begin working for a different employer upon the filing of a new H-1B. It also allows concurrent employment. The person may have more than one H-1B at a time. You can have two full-time jobs, a full-time and a part-time, or two part-time jobs. This is a strategy we employ when people are not happy with their employer or employers are not happy with their people. You are permitted to have a dual intent to immigrate to the United States and hold an H-1B status and it is important therefore if your client wants to stay permanently that you look for solutions. In terminating an H-1B, a person is out of status immediately upon termination. In practice, immigration allows a reasonable time to file a change of status to another category. Generally, that's the B-2 status uh, as a visitor for pleasure. 
and the employer is responsible for return transportation unless the individual finds another visa status. The TN visas award for Canadians and Mexicans, this has to do with the Western Hemisphere. It's limited to specific occupations listed on the NAFTA treaty. The educational credentials of each applicant must match the requirement and the TN visa initial admission is up to three years. If you have a Canadian foreign student, this is the visa that they go to when the H-1B cap is, is still cooking or it hasn't been re or has been reached. There is no dual intent, so therefore you still want to contemplate changing to an H-1B if applying for a green card. And a Canadian nationals, again, do not need visas and may make an application at the border. Mexican nationals require a visa, and although there's no statutory limitation on how many times the TN can be renewed, a renewal request will eventually be denied for an immigrant intent, so you want to have another solution for your Canadian and Mexican clients. A word on Australian citizens, an E3, an application can be submitted to the U.S. Consulate Abroad for, or domestically to the USCIS. There is no premium processing of these cases. It is for, again, a specialty occupation requiring at least a bachelor's degree. An E3 is v issued for Australian nationals for two years at a time. There is no dual intent and it's you, again, we suggest changing to an H-1 if the individual wants to pivot eventually and get to a green card. There is no portability clause like the H-1B. A new petition must be granted before changing employment. Although there's no statutory limitation on how many times the E-3 can be renewed, a renewal request will eventually be denied for immigrant intent. A word on the old visas. These are individuals that cannot be legends in their own minds. They have to be independently aliens of extraordinary ability. It's available to aliens who are extraordinary in the arts, science, business, education, or athletics who have achieved national or international acclaim. Initially, it's valid for up to three years. It can be extended indefinitely to increments of one year with the same employer, or you can get a new three years by new employers. A lot of the fields, particularly in music, entertainment, for scholars and lecturers, the old visas that we do, we get agents or we ask people to present their agents so that you can then have multiple uh, gigs, if you would, underneath the agent so that you don't have to go for concurrent O's or keep going back to the government. Old visas require an advisory opinion from a peer group describing the alien's ability and achievements in the field of endeavor and the nature of the duties to be performed. The old visas are wonderful visas. You are going to find your clients challenged if you apply for an O visa immediately after school, unless the person has a level of achievement that they've achieved before they came to the United States. Often we posit our O visas after the alien has left America and we make the application from abroad. Typically, you have to hit three out of six or three out of eight standards, depending on what visa you're applying for. There's the O1A, there's the O1B for people in business or in the creative, and you have to be careful. Foreign students like to call it the artist visas, and a lot of people feel that it's a very easily achieved visa. As the H-1B visas have capped out and all the other visas are are being scrutinized now by immigration, we see the O-1 visa changing. Particularly in recent years, the government is now asking if the individual has a financial interest in the business, and they're also looking to see whether or not the awards or the achievements that you've sustained are related to schools or academics. Be careful with amateur awards, because although you have an award, you're still considered to be an amateur and be careful where people are invited to be parts of conferences or lecturing or where there are clippings about you if it is normal for people to get that kind of sustained level of achievement. There is the extraordinary ability, the EB1, that's the employment-based first preference that allows you to apply for permanent residence. There, that application has three out of ten standards that you have to achieve and a totality of circumstances there may be a lot of O's out there, but there are a handful of people that have achieved certain recognition to get the extraordinary ability. Do not allow students or your clients to fall into the trap where they feel that they're entitled to something 
simply because other people have gotten it or because they googled it and it's now easy for them to believe that they can achieve it. Generally, a recognition that the government feels somebody's outstanding for an O is the precursor to do the extraordinary ability case. But there are multiple ways to achieve permanent residence for a client. You don't necessarily have to go nuclear, as it would, or do the extraordinary ability. It could be that you do the O visa, and then a person goes into the green card system based on a legitimate marriage to an American citizen, or based on a labor certification, or if they have other standards, there is the exceptional ability and so forth. I don't want to get off track from the foreign student client that you all represent, but the theory is the O visa is a visa that people are going to because they're always available. And if you want to help build the brand of your client and make sure that you assess their eligibility properly, you have to really study and become an expert in this area. There is the L1 visa i got to come up for oxygen. Uh, that allows people who worked as an intracompany transferee abroad to apply for a visa. An intracompany transfer is a person working for a parent, subsidiary, affiliation, or branch of a joint venture. At least one office must be in America and the other one outside. They have to have been working for the company abroad for a full year within the last three years and either working in an executive managerial, those are L1As, the executive or the managerial, or special knowledge, some proprietary knowledge, those are L1Bs. The L1As go for seven years, the L1Bs go for five years. Generally, the a process of getting permanent residence for L1As is a lot faster. You're deemed not to be a threat to the American job market, so you don't have to go through a labor certification and you go right directly to the immigration authorities where the L-1B five year has to do uh, the an opposite. So it's very important that you are aware of the option that a student can physically, if they wanted to, um, go back home, work for a full year for a company abroad and then pivot back into America and get a faster track green card than if they just looked aimlessly for a job in the United States. Spouses in the dependent L2 status may file applications for employment authorization and obtain an employment authorization document card. A word on the H-1B. Uh, from before, the H-4 visa holder, unless the extension of the case is on hyperdrive, the spouse there, the H-4, is not permitted to work. Often clients will come to your office where they're a foreign student and they're marrying or they are married you want to find a visa solution that will allow a foreign student to go into the workforce and not put pressure at home by allowing the spouse to work. The H and the L visas are both expressly permitted to have dual intents and are the best visas to posit. So you can imagine the sullen faces of clients when they try to do the H-1B and they're capped out. One of the options is the L visa where they work for a full year and then they transfer back into America in a better position. These are, of course, individuals that uh, have greater wheels on their heels, as it were, that they don't have children enrolled in school and have the capability, but homework has to be done by the attorney to make sure that the relationship is intact, that the quality of what they're doing, both abroad and domestically in the United States, meets standards. We see the L visas now being audited. And that is a, a very strong point when it comes to H-1Bs. There's actually an audit team where USCIS sends out individuals with badges and cameras, and they're going to see who paid the filing fees for you, was it the employer as required, what kind of role are you playing, and are you physically working full or part-time, and so forth. The J-1 exchange visitors visas are for trainees up to 18 months and for interns up to 12 months. Uh, some foreign students are prohibited from becoming J1s, particularly if you did the OPT, because you effectively had a full course of study, had the opportunity to train, um, and then going for a J1 would be an issue. You must have obtained a foreign degree and one year related work experience or five years of related work experience to be a trainee. And for an intern, you must have obtained a foreign degree within the past 12 months. The rules of sponsorship apply in addition to the USCIS regulations, and they're based on reciprocity, 
based on cross-cultural activities and orientation. Be careful here, counselors. Two-year foreign residency requirements. Some of the J visas holders must return home to their country for at least two years after completion of a program or obtaining a waiver before they can obtain an H or an L visa status or make an application for permanent residence. These visas are always available for medical students, summer work, au pairs in America, and people in the hospitality world. A word on e-visas. E-visas are for applicants of a treaty national or uh, where we do trade or we have commerce. If a person comes into your office and you see if they are from a nation that we have such trade agreements or treaties, you have to make sure that the trading firm for which the applicant is coming to the United States has the nationality of the treaty country. A British national coming into your office must be working for a British firm and that firm either had to have already been registered at the American Embassy abroad or you can actually help posit this whole process. The international trade must be substantial in the sense that there is a sizable and continuing volume of trade. If you have a client that is manufacturing soccer balls in London, most of the trade has to be then with the United States and it has to be substantial. The trade must be principally between the U.S. and the treaty country for which it's defined to mean more than 50 percent of the international trade involved must be between the U.S. and the country of the applicant's nationality. Trade means the international exchange of goods, services, and technology. The title of the trade items must pass from one party to another. The applicant must be employed in a supervisory or executive capacity or possess highly specialized skills essential to the efficient operations of the firm. Ordinary skilled or unskilled workers do not qualify. So the e-visa is a wonderful visa if a client comes to you they don't have a bachelor's degree or they have a bachelor's degree and they couldn't successfully get an H1 because of the cap. They don't want to go abroad. They're not extraordinary in their field, but they do come from a treaty country. They can start their own company in the United States with the right uh, substantial uh, investment or they can join another uh, countryman of that nationality and this visa is often where students go. Again, you have to cover the threshold that somebody young or who's being recently educated in America is really essential to the work. Sometimes we look at the narrative for what they did before or we make the argument as we do in the world of O visas that the person came to America to refine one area. We had a cosmetologist who studied as an F1 in cosmetology school to learn the certain advent of certain colors but had already great achievements or started her own business uh, on an E2 basis. The E visas are wonderful visas, but today's session is on foreign students. The E2, again, the investor has to have either real or corporate person be a national of the treaty country. The investment must be substantial, must be sufficient uh, to ensure the successful operation of the enterprise. The percentage of the investment for a low cost business enterprise must be higher than the percentage of the investment in a high cost enterprise. It must be a real operating enterprise. Speculative or idle investments don't qualify. Uncommitted funds in a bank account or similar security are not considered to be investments. The investment may not be marginal. It must generate significantly more income than just to provide a living to the investor and the family. The investor must have control of the funds and the investment must be at risk in the commercial sense. Loans secured with the assets of the investment enterprise aren't permitted. The investor must be coming to America to develop and direct the enterprise. If the applicant is not the principal investor, he or she must be employed in a supervisory executive or highly uh, specialized skill or capacity. Ordinary skilled workers won't qualify for the E2. So for the E1, you're basically looking if the product is being traded or the E2 if a business is starting but there the government will not do it unless they smell the pasta. We tell people if you're starting a restaurant in America they want to see the red and white tablecloths, the waiters in place, the narrative online and the revenue being made. Until they smell the pasta and see the cheese and where it was bought and the rental income and everything that your employer, that your landlord has, they're not going to be convinced that this is going to work. 
There are wonderful visas, the E1 or E2, for students who are industrious in the spirit with which this country was started. Uh, for a complete listing of the treaty countries, please visit the State Department website at travel.state.gov um, and you'll be able to find it easily. Foreign students have to be sure to remain in status. If you overstay, you must apply for a new visa at the U.S. Foreign Consulate in the home country with plain manifest and electronics. The government now is very capable of seeing whether or not a person has overstayed. Again, the rule of thumb is for your clients, if you overstay even for a single day, your visa is no good by operation of law. In fact, there are ramifications if you overstay um, even beyond 180 days you are subject to a three-year bar, 180 days, not six months, 180 physical days. Sometimes they're sitting there with calendars marking them out. If you overstay for 365 days or more, you're subject to a 10-year bar. Now, students have special dispensation. If the expiration date is quote, unquote, D slash S, end quote, though that is duration of status, then even if the foreign national failed to maintain their non-immigrant status, i.e. they worked without authorization or overstayed, they may nevertheless obtain an immigrant or non-immigrant visa through processing at an American consular abroad. You are not deemed to have accrued any unlawful presence if you are admitted for duration of status. Hence, we don't encourage our clients to immediately change to a visitor or to another category because they lose that proper insulation. But good luck, uh, counselors, trying to get your clients' visas once they've overstayed here and they go home. The consuls will find other ways to dun them, so this is not a surefire way of getting your clients back. Let's assume your foreign student has navigated the waters properly, has a degree, has OPT, was able to convince an employer to get them a job or has a work visa. At some point, they may want to secure a permanent residence. The path towards getting permanent residence involves either family or work visas or investments. A family preference classification based on the petition of specific close relatives, spouses, adult children, parents, and siblings who are students or permanent residents of the United States can be made. Or petitions filed by sponsoring employers. Or in some cases, you can self-petition if you wanted to. Finally. Major investments in the United States in commercial enterprises, the EB-5, a program that my father testified in support of in the early 1990s, has proven to be highly successful. There's an enormity of fraud, but basically you could invest a million dollars and put 10 people to work and buy a green card, or half a million in a rural area where unemployment is very high, or invest in one of 800 regional centers where you park half a million dollars attributing it to 10 people and then you get your money back. Be very careful. The ethical propriety of lawyers here is being watched and it is a wonderful program. We don't want it done. Um, and if you don't know how it's managed, feel free to reach out to our firm. There are other additional methods of achieving permanent residency through political asylum, refugee, a battered spouse, or diversity lottery program as well. The rule of thumb, how long does a person have to work with their sponsor once they are a green card holder. Applications presume that the employer intends at all times to employ an applicant on a full-time permanent basis. If a person has never worked for an employer, applications can be filed with evidence the employee has the intention to work for the employer upon the approval of an EAD, that's the Employment Authorization Document or Green Card. After the green card has been issued, if a person loses their job after obtaining a green card and all parties were acting in good faith as to their intention, the alien is entitled to maintain their permanent resident status. Although there's no statutory limit for time for how long a person remains with the employer, the longer a person works with the employer after obtaining a green card, the easier it is to show that all parties acted in good faith. So to sum up the employment-sponsored preferences, the EB-1, they're EB1 through 5. The EB1 are for first preference aliens of extraordinary ability in the arts, science, education, business, or athletics. The outstanding professor and researchers are it's EB1 and 2. They're multinational executives, that's the uh, companion to the L1As. Um, and then there's the extraordinary ability individual who can self sponsor. 
The EB2 is the second preference. These are people who are doing work in the national interest, national interest waivers. You have advanced degree professionals, i.e. masters or bachelors plus five years experience is required to perform the job where you go through the labor department. You must be able to show the employer can pay their offered wage and the prevailing wage. You have the EB3, which is skilled workers, pre-certified shortages, and you have to show that the employer can, again, afford the prevailing wage. You have the EB4, which is the fourth preference. These are for special immigrants, religious workers, victims of spousal abuse, and certain former UN employees. And again, as I alluded to before, the EB5, the fifth preference, where investors, where you're creating in an entrepreneurially spirited statute, employment creation immigrants who invest either a million dollars or half a million in a targeted employment area and create employment for at least 10 qualified U.S. workers. The PERM process refers to the Labor Department. This is a certification for EB2 and EB3 based cases. This is where the Department of Labor application must test the labor market determining that there are no qualified U.S. workers available or willing to fill the offered wage uh, and position. Recruitment and advertising must be completed within a specific time frame before an application can be filed and a first certification is issued by the Department of Labor. Once the DOL has certified the application, the preference petition may be filed with the Immigration Services. Adjustment of status may be concurrently filed with preference petitions if the priority date is current and you may leave the employer and go to a new employer at certain stages and times provided there was no preconceived intent at the time of the original filing or fraud. Once a person has a green card, it's your task as a lawyer to then see that they get citizenship and until they are a citizen of the United States, individuals can actually be deported from the United States. So let's pull the lens back as it were on a camera. A foreign student comes to you, you have the opportunity, if you go into this field and you do this well, to develop a relationship in this transactional based area of law. To physically help them with their student visa, help them acclimate into the workforce, into an employment category, and then get them a green card. Well, your job's not finished until they're U.S. citizens. Certain countries do not allow their nationals to become citizens without abandoning their citizenship in their home countries. But U.S. citizenship generally has great privilege uh, and protocol. If you're born in America, you're naturalized in America or otherwise, U.S. citizenship really represents, I think, the crowning uh, completion of our work. If a person's born in America or a child is born in the United States, it is an American citizen. You could acquire citizenship at birth. If a child is born outside of America where one or both parents are U.S. citizens, they may acquire U.S. citizenship at birth. You could deri derive your citizenship through derivation through naturalization of your parents. A child who's born outside of America may become a citizen by virtue of the naturalization of his or her parents. And finally, there's the application of naturalization, the form N-400, where a person who obtained a green card based on employment may obtain after five years of uninterrupted permanent resident status or persons who obtain green cards through marriage to an American citizen may apply after three years of uninterrupted permanent resident status. You either have to have one and a half out of the last three years continuously present in America or two and a half out of the last five years if it's based on employment. The privileges of becoming an American citizen include the right to vote in U.S. elections, participating in federal programs such as Social Security, obtaining U.S. passports, ability to qualify for certain security clearances, and insulation from deportation and removal. You have no idea the scores of people that my dad and I, in the years that we've been practicing, I'm 50 years old, but the practice has been around for about 58, where we have um, been one application away from people being removed from the United States. Your job would be to encourage as many people to become citizens as possible. There are a lot of useful websites in the PowerPoint that I think would be useful. The firm website, our website is wildslaw.com. USCIS is, is USCIS.gov. The Department of State is estate.gov. The Department of Labor is dol.gov. The Social Security Administration is ssa.gov. 
and the state driver's licenses can be found as well. A brief word on our practice and the, and the standing of what it is that you're involved in. We've been doing this for 58 years. I don't know how long each of you have endeavored to get into this field, but I have to tell you that this beautiful diamond in the rough, this American experiment in democracy, you feel extraordinary as a lawyer, and there's no greater satisfaction, particularly in tough economic times, than a lawyer trying to help a foreign student come to the United States. This is an extraordinary trust. If you earn their respect, not only will you help them through their academics achieve the onboarding of a work and a job, but if you earn their trust for generations, you'll also find yourself rooting a very robust practice. I can tell you that it's been a privilege for me to develop that narrative, those relationships that I have for the years and my father before me. And it's my prayer that one of my children will come into what may be a third generation practice. We're dream makers. People come to this country and the foreign student should be given greater flexibility. In the old days, my dad explained that the OPT time was a wonderful time. Foreign students loved it. They were able to work and eat more. FICO wasn't taken out of their salaries and people didn't have to worry about H-1B caps and so forth. Now every foreign student effectively becomes an immigration a lawyer themselves and is nervous not only about achieving good grades but a good job. You can do a lot in this beautiful experiment in democracy if you're given the privilege of actually helping people on board in a seamless fashion. Our firm was created by my dad again on 53rd and Madison. We're still practicing in that office. It's limited to U.S. immigration and nationality law, and we are representing some of the finest U.S. international corporate clients and individuals for years. We're proactive and compliance driven in our approach to dealing with clients, and we're ethically concerned always as to the propriety of educating our clients and training our staff to make sure that we deliver prompt and manageable service. I urge you to contact us. If there are questions that come up, feel free to reach out to me. My email is michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at wildslaw, that's W-I-L-D-E-S-L-A-W dot com. It was my privilege to address you today. If there's any inconsistencies or the law changes, please be in touch so that we can clarify as needed. I am being given some questions. Um, if a student graduates and is trying to remain in the United States through a short break while applying to a graduate program that is also in the States or following spring semester, for example, is there a visa extension to the student visa that would be applicable in such a situation? So if a student graduates and is trying to remain in America through a short break, generally summers are expected that you're not going to be going into full status. It really depends on the nature of that program that you have. Your instincts are good, whoever asked this question, because you want to make sure your student client does not fall out of step with their status. It really depends ultimately um, on, the, on the program, and anybody could email me that question, get me a copy of the schedule, and I can answer you directly. Um, they're loading more questions. Are there industry-specific considerations that should be taken into account when deciding which visa or graduating student should apply for? Yes, there are. It's impossible for me to cover it in the last one and a half minutes. Um, I can tell you that fashion and entertainment and nightlife and coutures are more old visas where investments in the financial realm are H-1Bs, L visas, and Hs. Um, but, you know, we've been creative through the years. Um, that is a, a specific uh, occupational driven visa. You could have an H-1B visa for a physician who's a calorie counter in a restaurant. So there are ways for people who are studying sciences, biotech, who have flower, you know, degrees as uh, florists or horticulture studies to become biotech uh, efficient uh, visas. So we have to look at those. Uh, the second part of this question, what are some of the most common misconceptions about making the change from a student visa to work or other visa? The most common misconception is that you can't do it. There's always a way to help your client. 
often we have clients going from master's levels until we can posit away. Imagine this, a person coming to America or a bachelor's degree where they got kept out on the visa has the extra privilege of studying more while they can still file H-1Bs. There's nothing prohibiting somebody from going forward. So the greatest misconception in our field is that there's no path for foreign students. Again, a student can go back home for a year and then come back on the L. They could raise their brand and qualify for the O, or they can start their own business in the E. So the misconception that I hate most is that there is no solution. Find one. With that, we end. I wish everyone Godspeed. Be in touch if we could be of any service.